Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Lou DiGennaro, President and CEO of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the world's largest nonprofit health organization dedicated to funding blood cancer research and providing education and patient services. Lou has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Lou, for joining us today. Very happy to be here. So cancer research, blood cancer research, has evolved so tremendously over the last decade. It's, it's quite astounding, but we still have quite a ways to go. Talk about the state of cancer research, and, and in particular, if, if looking at your career, the evolution of technologies, it would be just, just be so interesting, I think, to, to talk about how cancer research was pursued in, in, at the beginning of your career and yeah. how it's being pursued now. Yeah. Let, me, let me start with the fact that your viewers might find astounding, actually, and that is that the blood cancers taken together, leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, are the third largest cancer killer in the United States today, a third only to uh, lung cancer and, and colon cancer. So it's a major medical issue. Uh, the way we treat the blood cancers, the way we do research around the blood cancers has, as you said, changed dramatically in the last uh, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, so we, we've gone from a, a lack of a good understanding of the molecular basis of the disease, now forward to a very strong understanding and a very deep understanding of that molecular basis. That's taken us on the treatment side from the chemo, the the sledgehammer the of very, chemotherapy. The very, very crude and and very destructive yes. uh, approach. Yes. That that in and of itself, the treatment created sometimes as much pain and suffering as the disease. That's correct. The chemotherapy toxic treatments actually born of uh, of uh, uh, warfare agents, but then turned to do good. Right. Uh, in the treatment of cancer, but still with many toxic side effects. But a as our understanding of the molecular basis of the disease has improved, our ability to target therapies uh, to the disease itself and leave the good cells of, of the body alone. On the molecular has also level. Occurred. Yeah. And that's been pioneered in the blood cancers. A dozen years ago, uh, with funding from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, an investigator. Uh, named Brian Drucker uh, discovered a, a drug that uh, kills chronic myeloid leukemia cells but spares the good cells in the body. <clears throat> that discovery did two things. It provided, it, it, it took a disease with a three-year life expectancy, patients would have a three-year life expectancy from that horrible state to a disease that is uh, a chronic disease, patients treat themselves at home by taking a pill every day. And frankly, those patients, CML patients, are going to die from something else. They're not going to die from their leukemia. They live long, healthy, productive lives. So that was the, the, the treatment side of what that breakthrough did. Um, on the scientific side, it changed the paradigm of how we think about treating cancer. Again, away from toxic drugs and to a drug that targets the cancer and leaves the healthy cells of the body alone. Um, that continues to be the theme now and with the advent of our understanding of the human genome now uh, is increasing at a great pace led by the blood cancers, led by research in the blood cancers. Uh, but now uh, treatments are evolving for lung cancer and other cancers that are, are that model that, that model um, targeted therapies. And it, it, it tilts so much. It tilts not only the, the treatment approach in a treatment setting, mm -hmm. but it, it, it tilts investment in research into different types of research. It, it tilts the investment in the equipment that is used for research. Mm -hmm. It changes the, the environment in which treatment occurs from the hospital to the home, from a, a pill mm -hmm. that whose incremental cost, if you don't include the cost of funding the, the research, which is embedded in any medication, yes. but, the, but the cost of actually producing that treatment, that individual pill is so much less than, than the whole idea of, 
of having to monitor patients while they undergo this, this very brutal regimen of treatment. Yes, yeah, and, and you'll appreciate it, um, a treatment like that where a patient um, treats themselves at home with a pill a day um, uh, reduces the burden on the healthcare system overall. When you talk about hard-nosed return on investment, mm -hmm. if you don't include those other costs, which are so substantial as to almost be incalculable, uh, you do a, a, a real injustice. So the, the contribution that is made to an organization like this, yes. well, that might be investing over years and indeed decades mm -hmm. in research, when you start to then look at the return on investment in those terms, it's a very high leveraged investment. Absolutely. In the, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is a 65 year old organization. We were, just to give you a little bit of a history, we were founded by uh, a father and mother who lost their 16 year old son to leukemia. And their desire was to find cures for these diseases and make certain that other parent, parents didn't have the same experience that they did. We've tracked true to their desire ever since. The bow of the ship, if you will, for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is research and funding that research and finding treatments. Um, we uh, surpassed a major milestone last year. Last year we uh, surpassed $1 billion in support for cutting edge research in, in our history. So a billion dollars invested. A billion dollars. And, and what I can tell you in terms of results, we're very results or oriented. Our goal is to be as strategic and effective as we possibly can with the dollars that, that uh, donors generously give us. When we look back, in the, when I look back in the funding history of the organization, our funding has touched the discovery of virtually every therapy currently used to treat the blood cancers. So we think that's a, a wonderful return on investment. But I'll take it one step further for you. These, these therapies have been pioneered in the blood cancers, but now are paying benefit for other cancers and frankly, other kinds of diseases. The targeted therapy I mentioned is first approved for chronic myeloid leukemia, is now approved to treat 10 other diseases, including some solid tumors. Um, uh, there's a drug called um, uh, rituximab, again, developed initially to treat leukemias and lymphomas. Now it's used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. So our investment in blood cancer research has paid benefit for blood cancer patients with new and innovative therapies, for patients with other types of cancer, and now even for patients with other chronic diseases like arthritis. Now you have a very interesting and in many respects unique model. You have a model that is um, th that has been designated the Therapy Acceleration Program. Yes. Could you talk about that model and why that was developed and what the return mm -hmm. is for that approach to create a, an even higher leverage point for yes. the, the, the society? Yes. When I look back at my professional career, I spent a dozen years in academic science mm -hmm. and then another 15 years in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry. Another, another shift. Yeah, and, and, and what took me from the academic arena into the, into the uh, pharmaceutical, the biopharmaceutical industry, was a desire to see that laboratory discoveries were translated all the way into something that paid benefit for patients. Right. It's difficult to do that in an academic environment, but it's what you do in the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, taken that one step further now by joining the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, in all honesty, I'm actually closer today to helping to bring therapies to patients than even when I was in, in the pharmaceutical industry. And I've been able, I feel I've trained myself based on my experiences uh, across my entire career for exactly this role I have today. The society exists to find cures for the blood cancers and to make certain that patients have access to life-saving treatments. Um, to come back to the Therapy Acceleration Program, when I joined LLS, now looking at the portfolio of projects that we were funding, not only through an academic science lens, but through a drug discovery and drug development lens, what I realized was a certain fraction, 10% of those projects every year, moved out of 
um, basic research and into product development. Right. Going exactly in the direction we were hoping that they would go toward therapies for patients, but they were floundering. And they were floundering because it's difficult to do the applied science that's required to develop a drug in an academic arena. We created the therapy acceleration program to harvest out of the grant projects, those projects that had moved in the right direction, that, and that were most patients, promising, that were very promising, and help them get over the development hurdles, right. help them get close, closer and closer to patients. And we've been, been successful at doing that in a number of cases. The program expanded to include partnerships with small biotechnology companies as well. These are companies that have agents that might be active in the blood cancers, <clears throat> but frankly, not for scientific or medical reasons, but for economic reasons, were not being developed in the blood cancers. So these are your services to scientists, these are your services mm -hmm. to uh, drug producers, these are your, your partnerships with academic institutions and so on, but you also yes. provide other services. We do, we provide services directly to patients, education programs, support groups. And their families. Uh, and their families. We, we have a, a wonderful type of, well, it's not fair to call it a support group, but it's a support mechanism. It's called the first connection, where we'll connect a newly diagnosed blood cancer patient with a patient, a, tr a trained peer mentor, a patient mm -hmm. who has been through exactly that same diagnosis. So they have one-on-one -on -one support from someone who's been through it, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have programs for financial aid for patients as well. Um, add to that um, our activities on the policy and advocacy side. But before we get off of that, your financial aid to patients is also incredibly important yes. because we can't move beyond the simple fact that your economic status in this society is so much a determinant of what treatments mm -hmm. um, you can afford. Um, so talk, uh, talk just very briefly about, about that aspect of what you do. One of the barriers is certainly cost. Right. And we recognized some years ago that uh, there were a group of patients who, blood cancer patients who were working, who had insurance, but who could not afford the copay for their drug. And so we established a, a copay um, program to help offset that cost. Last year, I'm actually very proud to say, we deployed $50 million in assistance um, to help uh, needy patients uh, pay for the cost of copay for their drugs and actually get access to the drugs that they were being prescribed. And these their, are working Americans. These are people who are holding jobs, yes. helping to support their family. There, there are people who are dealing with the the issues of, of having a disease and their own personal trauma that is associated with that yes. while they're also paying their taxes. Well, the, uh, the, the cost of copay, the cost of the copay for these drugs can be significant. Right. It can be a significant out-of-pocket expense. Uh, many patients pay a coinsurance rather than a copay. A coinsurance would be a percentage of the cost of the drug and that can uh, can be a substantial out-of-pocket cost. In, in the case of patients who are on Medicare and happen to be in the donut, in the donut hole, right. as it's called, it can be 20% of the cost of the drug. So this, this, this can be a substantial financial burden for a, a family. And, you, and last year it was $50 million last that year was, you... We, we, we dispensed $50 million uh, to needy patients to help cover those costs and other insurance costs as well. And talk about how you encourage policies yes. that help to drive this kind of research and these types of services forward. Uh, we're, we're in a wonderful position to be able to partner with the FDA. Uh, we, ca we, uh, we can educate them about the state of the art of the science and the medicine. We can educate them about the unmet medical need that patients have. We can be the voice of the blood cancer patient, frankly of all cancer patients, in front of the FDA. And we do that on a regular basis. We meet with them regularly. Cl clearly we can't influence their decision, but we can give them a better information base so that they're able to make us a, a smarter And awareness, awareness is a type of influence. It, 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 because people of goodwill sometimes just don't know. Yes. Um, and 
ensuring that people know is, is, is a way to, to connect that goodwill to knowledge and make it actionable? Yes. And, and in a way, that's, that's clearly, clearly what we're doing. We're uh, raising the level of uh, understanding and awareness of the blood cancers. New drugs are being approved on a, on a regular basis for the blood cancers. It's, it's really remarkable. The, the, the pipeline is full, and the FDA has seen fit to approve many of these. And, and, and the, uh, the, the light is very bright, really, at the end of that tunnel. Um, the access piece, again, comes back to the cost issue that we've been talking about. And so we're in front of both federal and state legislatures on a regular basis, again, representing the voice of the cancer patient, uh, helping to bring awareness to the issue uh, to the government, both federal and state, and making certain that legislation that gets passed is in the best interest of cancer patients. We've also become something of a watchdog on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. The, the Affordable Care Act has many provisions that have been helpful to cancer patients, uh, uh, removing limitations on, on lifetime caps, uh, making certain that um, children up to the age of 26 can remain on their, on their parents' uh, insurance uh, plans. But uh, there, are, there are pieces that um, cause, cause issues as well. Uh, I'll give you one specific example. There are, as the regulations were being written in the state of Washington implementing the Affordable Care Act, um, the regulators implemented a, um, a two-year waiting period for a stem cell transplant. Right. Well, a, 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 a patient with an acute leukemia can't wait two years for right. a stem cell transplant. We were able to activate our local advocates. We were able to activate our national team. We were able to uh, bring patients forward bring forward patient stories. And long, long story short, we were able to convince the regulators there to reduce that two-year waiting period to zero. Too often it seems to me that in the, in the politics surrounding these types of, of laws yeah. uh, as the ACA, and we can just cite example after example after example, people forget that time, particularly when it comes to health, is of the essence, it is literally of the essence. Let me tell you the, one of the challenges in the blood cancers. Um, we don't know what causes them. It, and because we don't know what causes the blood cancers, it's difficult to take a prevention strategy right. at the moment. As a consequence, it's difficult